session post lunch. The session is using the TPT committee. How does the TPT committee functions? What is its mandate? And what is the best way to engage in its work? The session would be the speaker for the session would be Mr. Eric Wickstrom, Mr. Matthew Ferrero, and Mr. Anwar H. Sheikh. By now, we already know Mr. Eric and Mr. Matthew, but I would like to give a brief introduction about Anwar sir. Anwar Hussain Sheikh is the chairperson of the Committee on Technical Barriers to Trade under Council for Trade and Goods at the World Trade Organization. He is the first Indian representative to chair the committee after 10 years. Previously, he worked as the director in the field of infrastructure PPP for the Ministry of Railways under the Government of India. He has also worked as the director in the Department of Economic Affairs under the Ministry of Finance and a counselor for permanent mission of India to WT. He has pursued his Masters of Public Administration, Edward Mason Fellow, Matter in Public Policy and Administration from the Howard Kennedy School in 2010 to 11. So I would like to request uh, Mr. Eric Matthew and Anwar sir to come and take over the message. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, maybe we could put the first slide up. So what we will do in this session is we will talk a little bit about the, the work of the committee. So this session will be a little bit more practical and uh, we are fortunate because this hardly ever happens that when I do this we also have the chairman of the TPT committee here, Anwar. So Anwar, you, you jump in, correct me anytime. <laughs> and also it's nice because Anwar can give, I think, India's perspective but also the perspective as chair of the committee. Um, to the session. So um, this this is how the TBT committee looks. I don't know if you see the, the picture, but we, we usually sit up, up here and the chairman is the one in, in the middle um, of uh, us. And then all the countries at the WTO sit, sit at the So this was pre-COVID. I don't know if I have a picture from during the COVID time. But during the COVID time, of course, we, we introduced something called Interprefy which means you can also, as a member, participate from the capital virtually. It's not Zoom, it's not uh, WebEx, it's another form of participation, but this has increased the level of participation in the committee. Of course, now we're back to normal, so it looks like this again. Last week it was like this, with increased participation from capital, which I think was very, was very good. So, what, what is the mandate of the TBT committee? I don't know if you remember, but yesterday morning we had one of the ten affirmations was whether it's about trying to solve disputes, whether we have a mandate to solve disputes, or whether it simply is a forum for discussion of trade issues related to TPP. So the mandate is actually very simple. This is the only text that exists in the TPP agreement about the mandate. So. Basically, we are there to, to discuss or to consult on any matter relating to the implementation of the agreement. Um, so it is essentially an opportunity, it's a forum where any country can come and raise a matter which they find important with respect to implementation. So the issue as the example of uh, exports of shrimp or problems you have in an export market for that. Typically, it falls under TBT. If there is a concern, you can bring this to the committee for discussion. But it can be other issues about uh, standards, about transparency, about notifications. It's a very, very um, brief and simple mandate. There are no terms of reference or anything like that. From, so from this, the committee has to construct a way of working. So that's, that's what I'd like to explain in, in a few words and how, how that works. The SPS, just to show you, the SPS committee has almost exactly the same wording. It's also very simple. The idea is to create a regular forum for consultations on any issues necessary to discuss the implementation of, of the agreement, so and the furtherance of its objectives. So, TBT and SPS have very simple mandates in terms of what, what we are supposed to do in Geneva. So, when, when do we meet? So who decides and when do we, when does the WTO technical buyers to the buyers to trade meet? Um, this, this is just an example. These are the dates for, for, sorry, for 2023. And as you see, we just had our regular meetings on March. That was last week. 
from 8 to 10 March. It was a, a full week. Then we have always meetings in June or July sometimes and meetings in November. And we have already issued the dates for 2024. And it's always March, June, and November. And because we issue them one year ahead, um, delegations can already plan other activities. We always give the dates more than a year ahead. So we know the dates for the November 2024 meeting on the so members can plan according to that. But you see there are many more events around the meeting. So each QBT committee meeting essentially has three regular meetings per year. Sorry, there are three regular meetings per year. There are three informal meetings and usually an event of some type. And if I go back to the slide, so someone mentioned here that there was an event last week on carbon standards. I don't know who it was, but, but that is an example of the type of event. This one was slightly disconnected from the committee, but it was an event that was aimed at looking at the discussion of steel or steel standards. I wonder if I could close the door there. The discussion of steel standards and how they are relevant to the discussions on in the TBT committee. But the way each week works is that usually the Monday is free for delegations. They can then consult bilaterally on STCs to see if they can solve problems. Tuesday are thematic sessions. <coughs> Last week there was one thematic session on climate change and one on standards in the area of plastic. Because climate change and plastic use is at the top of the debate in terms of regulations and standards in many countries. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday are the regular committee meetings. <coughs> Usually Wednesday and Thursday are full in terms of specific trade concerns. And uh, so, yeah, Wednesday, Thursday are full, and the Friday we deal with other issues on the agenda. So that's the full week, and it's three times a year. Then, then we hold those are the three regular meetings which I explained to you, and Anwar would chair those regular meetings. For the thematic sessions, we would then have a a, a moderator who's chosen, who then Anwar decides on, who, who will help him in moderating those sessions, and those. Last, for the last one, we had a moderator from the United States on plastics, and we had from, where was it? India. In, that's right. Also, Ashish. Ashish uh, was also the one moderating the session on, uh, on climate change. Then, we usually have three informal meetings that are in between in order to set up. And actually, the informal meetings are the important ones in many ways, because we set up the agenda and countries prepare. So ahead of the June meetings, we are likely to have an informal meeting on May, if I can get Anwar to agree on a date, which is not very easy. We've been trying. <laughs> <laughs> we were trying to fix it at 11, and I have colleagues at me tell, when you're in India, can you get Anwar to agree on the 11th of May? And I said, I will try. <laughs> but we don't have agreement yet. So we set then the, the meeting date for May for the informal, and that sets up our meeting in, in June. And as I said, usually one event. But next year, the main event, do we have that second? <coughs> maybe not yet, but maybe last October, just to, to yeah. show that we, we try to keep it interesting and varied. Last October, we held a symposium on regulatory bottlenecks with a view to showing how there are supply chain bottlenecks not only caused by you know medical disruptions and the like, but also by regulations. And it was a full afternoon with uh, a number of ambassadors, a number of, of technical people from across the world discussing these issues. Okay. So that was the question when. So what, what times we meet? And the main thing to think of is very regular. Uh, you never have the excuse that we didn't know when the meeting was. It's planned uh, way ahead of time. So those were the thematic sessions. Just to give you an idea that when we have had the thematic session, the recording is posted on the website. So if you could not participate, you can always go back and listen to it. And also you will have all the presentations also posted on the website. And this is the TBT Gateway. If you go to Google and type in WTO TBT Gateway, you get to all the events <coughs> and the news items on, on technical barriers to trade. So where, maybe a very easy question, but it's not so obvious why this is the case, but all meetings are only of the WTO, only in Geneva. 
Um, we do not have, like other international organizations, regional offices or national offices. As I said yesterday, WTO staff-wise is a rather small organization, so it only holds meetings in Geneva, other than this type of technical assistance, but this is not a meeting of the committee or the WTO, it's another kind of event. So maybe in the future that should change. You know, why could we not have meetings in the regions? Or why could we not move around? We like traveling, it's nice to visit other countries. But so far, only meetings in Geneva. Uh, COVID changed that, of course, because we, we were able to um, bring in capital-based people for the first time. And I never quite understood why we didn't manage to do this before. It took a terrible crisis with all the negative health consequences for us to realize that we have the technology to bring in people from capitals. And I think this is a game changer because for many countries around the world, and most of WTO members are developing countries, they cannot send people to Geneva three times a year, let alone to informal meetings in between. It becomes nine meetings a year. It, it doesn't work. Uh, it's too much. So in that sense, it has now enabled participation from, from other countries. <clears throat> and so who is it who comes? Who is it who is present in, in Geneva? And who leads the meetings? Well, the chairperson is Anwar, standing here, and he's the one who, who currently leads. The, the way the chairs are chosen is somewhat of a, maybe you know more and more on this, somewhat of a murky process. It, uh, maybe you should comment on that rather than me, but it's uh, it, it. Uh, Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, do you want me to go through what I do or how about for me? How are you chosen? How are you chosen? How does it work? Uh, this is uh, not a very well laid out process. First of all, good afternoon. Yeah, uh, good afternoon, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, just like uh, uh, the present uh, Mahima, Mahima just Mahima was that Mahima introduced. Mahima introduced. Uh, India took over chairmanship of this committee, or for that matter, any committee of the WTO, after a gap of ten years. Uh, it, it's rather counterintuitive <coughs> considering the number of issues that we have at the WTO at large and at the TBT specifically, not having a representation in any form at the formal committee level was slightly uh, counterintuitive. Uh, largely also because the way chairs are selected, how the chairpersons are selected to various committees in the WTO. Okay, largely because how they are selected, uh, first uh, a representation from various regions of capital. One is one group of countries are called developed countries, they have a group. Then there is the GRULAC, the Latin American countries. Then you have the developing countries and the developing countries from the Asia. So the chairs rotate between these countries. Across the committees, 13 committees, and across the region, and within the region, for example, if Asia was to be chairing a particular committee, and within Asia, there is a lot of deliberation, negotiation that goes on between the members of the Asian developing countries. Uh, ironically, whenever there was a representative from Asia in any of these committees, it was someone from Southeast Asia. I, and for first reasons, one would very clearly understand a lot of committees are chaired by Philippines, Singapore. While they are developing countries, when it comes to how the meetings are conducted, they have uh, an inclination which is not necessarily of the developing country. And we have not been represented for a very long time. So the ambassador took a very conscious call. The first thing he said, you know, we had a meeting, I still remember that meeting. I was, I, I just walked into Geneva, into BMI, that was my second month, I was trying to get handled on all the issues. Uh, but he called a meeting and he said, hey, this is not right for India that we don't even pitch for a position, let alone arguing later. So in that meeting, he said, is anyone willing? I said, 
I'm always willing. Uh, even though I had absolutely no idea of what happens in these committees. If, if Eric remembers, uh, you don't remember, but Devin remembers very well. On the, f it, the first meeting, TVT meeting that we had, I had attended, it was in a hybrid. There was an STC. <coughs> Devin walked across to me and said, I'm with this STC what India is raising is also incidentally the same STC, the same contents which China is uh, raising. Do you want to club it? I literally, you know, <laughs> I said, what on earth? I don't know them. And I said, first I thought, you're saying China and you don't look Chinese. <laughs> I thought he was from China and he was trying and asking me whether we want to. <laughs> and second, I did not understand what he was trying to say. Immediately I sent a message to my predecessor saying that such an issue has come up. What do I do? I don't know what, 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 you know, how you operate here. He said, that's very surprising. Such an issue never came before. So I don't know how to do it. <laughs> So that was how raw I was when I worked into PMI. It was the second month when PR said, I said, no problem, I'm volunteering. He said, glad. Apparently, the PR said, the ambassador said, okay, when I dug back and saw why India had no representative in the last so many years, he said, people generally were not volunteering. So I said, no problem, I can, I can definitely join in. And I think I've done what I'm supposed to know it, jump into the water. And that year we could not get the chair. And the next year we got it because the ambassador took it up and he went into reforming the whole process of how regions are represented, who has to be uh, you know, nominated, how you pick it up. That was the beginning of a TBD chair. And this year, the fight is one more time <coughs> ongoing, even as I speak now. The tenure generally is from end of March to the beginning of March next year. TBT committee is a subsidiary committee of the main CTG committees. After the CTG committee chairs are decided and the subsidiary committees chairs are decided. So main subsidiary, main committee chairs are just decided in the last general committee that was held on 6 and 7 and subsidiary committees are had to be decided. So I might have a over total June, July. I might have to actually, uh, Eric, I might have to conduct the June meeting. We don't know considering how things are going on. Or oh, you may so, stay until November. We don't know. So it, it did happen at one point in time. The Australian uh, uh, councillor who was chair two years back was perhaps. So that's the process. The process is not very, uh, very clearly laid out. It depends on who has got more strength, who can pull it. So the reason we got into it, I'll also mention, was because what Eric just mentioned in the morning, the morning session, India is not is always on the defensive. In the last TBT meeting that we had on uh, uh, this was 8th, 8th, 9th and 10th, there were 74 specific trade concerns <coughs> aged in the meeting. 74. Guess how many were against India? 18 were against India. Jyoti, the director from here, and Ashish. They were on the floor all the time. If, if, if you had not uh, watched continuously, if you were to switch on uh, the interpretifier virtual mode, every two hours, you would think these guys are working all through the day. So they were on the screen so long. Not just those 18 STCs the last meeting. If you look back at the total number of STCs that have been raised in the TVT committee meetings over the years, how many? 700 plus? Can you guess how many were in India? And remember, this is 164 mem uh, you know, countries or the members. <coughs> 700 plus STCs are raised in, in its record. And can you guess how many were in India? Okay. Yes. There are more than 117 STCs raised against India. Just need to recalibrate the number because some STCs have different numbers, sometimes there is an. So, the whole idea of having this workshop, the, the reason we came around, the reason I requested Eric and they to please come over and have is to make mm -hmm. us all aware of what we could do it, like what Eric said yesterday, every country has got the sovereign right to regulate. Do not be defensive of what we are doing, but at the same time, the first instance, the first reaction for all of us is perhaps this is violation of WTO rules. We do not even do the second layer of introspection. Okay, how can even if it is a violation, is there a technical way, a legal way of doing it? Not necessarily trade, restricting a trade. Like I say in my TVT informal meetings, 
uh, often times uh, the reasons countries raise STCs are not because they actually have a real trade concern. They do it because the required information is not coming through from a particular country. This is one issue that we also need to address at least in India from the inquiry points. Before, there is a long process before an STC is raised. A country notifies to WTO, not standard obviously, they notify uh, their regulation. Once they notify the draft <coughs> regulation, the time is given for 60 days to comment. And before they even comment, countries actually write to the inquiry points asking details about this particular draft notification. Once they have the information, they then have an effort, they have to do the due diligence of making an assessment whether this measure is going to impact their exports or not. And then they ask for a bilateral meeting with the country that is proposing uh, regulation. Even after the bilateral, if you are not able to explain them our policy <coughs> objectives, legitimate rights, then they still feel that is the time they raise an STC. But you know what happens in the case of India? They write to an inquiry point, there is no response. Inquiry point takes those requests, in turn sends it down the line ministries, and those responses from the line ministries don't come to them. I don't hold inquiry points also responsible. But inquiry points, they, they feel they have done the job by sending it down. They are not following it up for the responses. In the meantime, they are not even acknowledging the country that has raised that uh, inquiry. And at, at the end, they end up raising an STC. So, chunk of our STCs, we could just do it away by providing the information that we are supposed to do it. Which I hope is one of the takeaways from, from today's meeting. You want me to say more on how the whole STC process goes, or you want me to or I'll, something else? I'll continue on, okay. and then I'll come bring you in on that. So, <clears throat> okay. so, so this was, we were under the question about who is there, who is at the committee, and who leads the committee. So Anwar is the chair of the committee, and he was explaining now uh, how that process takes place. Um, so also, I mean, as, as the chair, Anwar also is the face outwards of the committee. So here it was, for example, at an event where we launched our eating service, which we will also talk about, where you have Anwar next to our deputy director general, which is Jean-Marie Boga at the WTO, and representatives of the UN DESA and the ITC. It was just one, one event we had last year. So the ones who are at the meeting are the members and observers, and it's important that it is understood, this is often sometimes a question I get, you, you decide who represents you at the WTO. We have nothing to say about that, and that has to be clear. It may sound obvious, but actually for some countries, it's not clear. And where, with respect to TPP and SPS, expertise is very, very important. Because you have, you have heard last, yesterday and a bit of today, with the details on tuna, how technical TBT is. And SPS is also technical. So it is very important that you have the right people who are representing you, whether you are on the defensive or offensive. So um, a, big, a, big of, a big message we would like to get across is the preparation of these meetings from home is very important. And it may not always be so that you have a local, local delegate who knows as much about TBT as for instance Ashish and Anwar know, because now you have chaired so you know the background, but you will have one delegate who's covering <coughs> agriculture, intellectual property, services, and import licensing, and who's running around to different meetings. How, how can they defend themselves when they have an STC on accreditation, laboratories, and conformity assessment procedures? So the link back home is extremely important with respect to TBT and, uh, and SPS. Then there are also the observers who are there at the committee and you have the international standards organizations like the ISO codex, etc. But the more important message is with respect to the membership and how you represent yourselves. One more word on this is some countries organize a, a national mirror committee at home. So for instance, Kenya, and you may have realized the last meeting, you, I think you, you whispered in my ear during the meeting, Kenya, 
Why are they speaking all the time? <laughs> they, they are very active and they, they established two, three years back a national mayor committee on TBT. They meet ahead of each meeting with stakeholders to try to see what are the issues that concern them, what should be raised, and how should they defend themselves. They decide then during that committee, the mirror committee in Nairobi, who will go to the meeting, how their positions will be defended, etc. And it creates a very professional, um, how should I put it, but it gives a good impression in terms of that they are defending their rights and also um, both defend themselves, but also are on the offensive. And several other African countries are, are, are now coming on board. Namibia, we see, has a whole different presence today than they had 10, 10 years ago. Okay, so what do we talk about? We talked about the who, the when, the where, but on what? Um, I would focus mainly now on the first part, which is with respect to the specific trade concerns. Just to give you an idea of the numbers, and how this works. Anwar already said a little bit about this. Um, so I think what's important, and I think that's what you were getting into, is this, this relationship between <coughs> notifications, trade concerns, and disputes. In a way, you can turn this around and put it on its head and make it look like an inverted pyramid, where the top, the top part are the notifications. So on the left, you have the number of notifications in total. So there are around 47,000 TPT notifications that have been submitted since 1995. So they are in the tens of thousands. But as we were just saying, only 759 specific trade concerns, STCs, in the middle. And we, what we see in the committee is up until just we just see the middle part. What happens on top can be bilateral between members. Because if, if India sees a notification by the by China on tea, for instance, which will affect their exports, your first move is to talk to China, not to come to WTO, to try to solve it then. So we won't see this at the level of the committee. If you don't resolve the issue bilaterally, you always have the option of raising it as a trade concern. And if that doesn't work, there is always the option of going to dispute settlement, which is the bottom of the pyramid. And you only have, that was the example of the tuna, um, case we just heard, the tuna dolphin case. That was one of the nine, I think there are ten now, disputes that have come up in WTO on TBT issues. But they, and on, on the right you have the SPS numbers, but we are focusing on the TBT. So the main thing to remember here is a lot of notifications, fewer STCs, and even fewer disputes. Uh, I, you will be in a better position to explain. Till some time ago, I did observe that, you know, TBT notifications were mapped to HS codes in the EP, EP uh, or ITIP, uh, but it vanished suddenly. What vanished? It vanished, the HS link vanished suddenly. It, every, everything became blank. On, on what? The on, on the TBT notifications and which industry oh. or which sector it belonged to. Okay, so can you, can you provide uh, some explanation of yeah. some some insights into it? You know? yeah. Why did it uh, vanish and was it some interest group? Some countries did it influence uh, more than uh, the other? Because always, you know, when these TBT measures are taken, it's the private industry's interest. Yeah. So the technological leaders will always have larger number of notifications and they will have the industry to protect and you know, push yeah. for. I think what might have happened, but I'm, I might be wrong, is that we, we used to have what you mentioned, the IMS information, but that's an old system. It was very clunky and not user-friendly. So we migrated everything to ePing, which is a new system, and which Matteo will speak about a little bit later or tomorrow morning. And but the, the, the notifications did not vanish. They, they continue to increase over time. No, the thing, so. the HS notifications are mentioned but like SPS, like animal products, so much notification. Uh, yeah. uh, say, you know, when we talk about animal products, uh, total number of notifications, say 37,000. And, you know, animal products had, uh, say, about 100 notifications. And vegetable products had about 14,000. So likewise, you know, so the product coverage, which respect to, with respect to uh, the HS scores, 
was missing in the case of TBT. I cross from 1 to 97 chapters. I, I don't know how to answer that because we, the product coverage that we have now on all notifications is about 80%. So it exists, but, but I think it's a question of what interface one is using. So you will see this clearly on the TVT IMS interface. The problem we have is if there is a notification that comes into us without an identified HS coverage, it's very difficult to link that notification to a particular product. But, but right now, the effort is trying to prod and poke and get members to use the HS code, but it's around 80% as it is now. So what, what I wanted to show with this, so the first part of the pyramid, um, the notifications, here you see the increase in notifications um, up until 2022. And the blue are new notifications, the red are addenda, that's for instance when a member has notified the fact that a draft measure has entered into force. And the other colors are less important, they're core agenda and revisions. But what you see are two trends. One, overall number of notifications are increasing. Second, members are increasingly notifying adoption of the final text, which is very important. There was a question yesterday about that, how do you access the final text? And third, maybe the overall trend is strongly upwards. We saw um, this year, it's a bit hidden by the picture, it's slightly lower, but the overall trend is upward in notifications. And then one can always ask the question, who is notifying? And this one shows here, um, the, red, the red is the number of WTO members that are notifying. The white are the number of members not notifying. So we have about 60, I can't see the lines, around 80%. Is that how it I think I'm over more like, members, more like 50, members, right? Uh, 50 more yeah, more it's about 50%, so about 80 members, which is about 50%, are notifying um, to the WTO. So there are about 50% members who are not notifying to the WTO. But for notification requirements, that's quite high in terms of participation rate of, of members. Um, <clears throat> if you look at the who is notifying most members, uh, sorry, who's notifying most technical regulations, these are the top 10 members. So you have the United States, Uganda, Brazil, EU, China, and then it goes down. And Kenya, you see, is coming up as a notifying member. But clearly, most members have uh, most notifications. The strongest notifier is the US. And the little blue are the notifications um, in the last year, 2022. You might be wondering, Uganda? <laughs> What's going on in Uganda? <laughs> One thing with Uganda, which is a little bit um, different, is that they notify everything. Also standards. You don't have to. In fact, you should be notifying technical regulations. But this is an issue where we have discussed with Uganda that there is a confusion there to some extent between what are standards and what are technical regulations. They're sorting it out, but in the meantime they're notifying all standards. <laughs> okay, and I think someone said there were 22,000 standards in India. If they had been notified, you would be off the charts. <laughs> so, so there is this issue a little bit behind it there. So I would say the, the real, in terms of the real participation application is US, Brazil, EU and China. If you look at them, um, who, the, how the notification rate has increased, this is notifications over time. The blue line is the US, or, or I'm sorry, I'm comparing different members. Blue line is the US, the red, orange line is Brazil, EU is the gray line, China is the yellow line, and India is the one at the bottom, is the green line. Okay, so there are quite a few and decreasing number of notifications. What is quite remarkable here is how steady the number is for certain developing countries. It's about the same number of notifications they, they issue per year. I think I had a graph here. If, here is if you put all members together. Sorry, this question. It can be other way also, because maybe it is not a trade barrier notification, so we are not notifying because there are no trade barriers? Yes, certainly. Um, Regulations are not there? 
But if you have a technical regulation, it needs to be notified. I mean, and as we said, most technical regulations will have some effect on trade. Even trade facilitative measures you notify. So because there is an effect on trade. But yeah, um, go ahead. I was just going to say on, on trade facilitative measure, measures. When you look at the Brazil um, spike in 2020, Brazil notified many, many technical regulations that were trade facilitative uh, and also in conformity assessment. Because of COVID. Because of COVID. And the idea was to facilitate trading PPEs and medical equipment and the like. So, again, here we aggregate all members. The blue is developed members, the orange is developing countries. And the gray, the gray is least developed members. So, you see the blue, how stable it's been over the last 25 years or so. The increasing number of notifications is the developing country members who are increasingly notifying. It's a remark we made yesterday too. Is it because they're regulating more? Is it because they are implementing the notification obligations better? My guess is something in between. You have an increasing trend of regulations, but also um, there is more notifications. Uh, Eric, this picture will completely change if you reclassify based on income. I've done that, you know, exercise. So what I found was high income countries notify the largest. Notify the largest. The largest. They have been consistent over time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The same point. Uh, high income countries notify the largest in terms of. Uh, if you use the World Bank income classification, this is WTO's classification. Okay. This is self declaration. Yeah. Self declaration. If you use income based classification, this picture will completely change. Yeah, no, as Almer is saying, this is aimed to show the consistency over time. Because if you go back a few slides, you're right, the US is on top here. Um, they, yeah, the US is on top. And the European they, Union. They, they're clearly yeah. higher. But this is just to show the evolution over time. And my point is that, that it has been quite steady at around 380 notifications per year uh, from developed countries. I'll, I'll share that study with you. Okay. So, um, the, the main type of measures that are notified are about protection of human health and safety. So, for those who think that SPS is, is about health and safety, actually the main type of notification on TBT is protection of human health and safety. Prevention of deceptive practices, so that would be labeling, for instance, and the tuna dolphin type label. And quality requirements and protection of the environment. And those are the main types of notifications. If you look at the product coverage, it's very mixed. Um, pharmaceuticals, I know there was representatives from pharmaceutical um, regulations, but electrical machinery, animals, vehicles, beverages. If this were SPS, it would really just be three colors. You know, uh, food safety, animal, plant life, and health. But TPT is very, very broad in terms of its coverage. So <clears throat> how about the, the trade concerns for the middle of the graph? Just to give you a few more ideas on this. And Anwar, if you want to jump in on any issue. Um, <clears throat> just to give you, this is the same graph, but for trade concerns. So we're not talking about thousands of notifications, but hundreds of trade concerns. And here, if anything, the, the, the trend is steeper. So you have increasingly more trade concerns brought. That's why we have meetings now that are over a week long. Um, the, the blue are the new concerns, and the orange ones are those concerns that you come back to that are old, that are still not solved. So those we refer to as previously raised concerns. <clears throat> so the new concerns are also increasing over time. We had a little bit fewer than normal last week, but otherwise we have quite a few um, specific trade concerns. Who are the ones who raise most concerns? Now I'm talking about raising. So this sometimes is confusing. I'm talking about the member who is on the offensive. They are raising a challenge against another member. So on the offensive. So here you have EU, US and Japan are the main raiser of concerns. So they're the top 10. Or here you have China is slowly going up the ladder in terms of the the country that is raising its concerns in, in the TPT committee. They're 
quickly moving towards the left. And you have to realize China became a member in 2001, so they were far behind. These figures are from 1995, so they're quickly catching up. Uh, of course, this is not a race, but it's not, not supposed to come to the top of the chart, but it's an indication of how much you use the committee to offensively address your issues at the WTO. Yeah, yeah, this is, this, I, I would want to tell uh, the participants to take a closer look here when we were one of the top countries when it comes to the saving issues is we don't even figure here, you see, and we've been here in 95. Yeah, that's the next. So if you look at those raised by India, so who is India raising against? Um, India have, has raised most concerns against the um, European Union, um, Brazil. Italy, Brazil, one against the US. So India has raised a total of 33 trade concerns um, in the committee, 1999 to 2022. <clears throat> if you look at those who are raising, uh, raising SECs against other members just with a few examples, okay, so choosing a few members, now this is not supposed to be representative, um, the red line is India. Okay, so you are, this again emphasizes the point quite inactive in terms of raising concerns. The green line at the top is the EU and the US. So they're the ones raising most concerns. And then you have China, and look at the way the, the line, the yellow line goes. China has increasingly started to raise concerns in the committee. And the blue is Brazil, which has been on a steadily, but low, but steadily raising, um, rising trend. Yeah, yeah. Okay. No. The point I was uh, trying to impress here is uh, uh, what my master keeps saying. Uh, if we are having offensive interest, it should reflect across the board. And this is one that where our offensive interest in terms of our exports should be reflected. If, if we are saying that our exports are suffering and that we are not making any human cry about it, then we are fought in some ways. If we do not have any instances, we should not have any concerns, then perhaps the claim that we are increasingly exporting, that we have become more capable, productive in terms of producing, also needs to be checked. So the point is that this is a neutral, very good indication of where we are. So my sense is we are not raising concerns, not because we do not have concerns, but we are not making use of the platform adequately. <coughs> Maybe other ways also, because when you see the previous slides, the uh, old, old STCs are being repeated. That means the STC is placed, a place given again on that. So, the, particularly, we also observe in our uh, case, uh, in particularly in ETO and Spice, they continue to give the same answer. So, there's no meaning in raising again. That's, that's a valid point, but I'm talking about a bigger picture. I'm talking about if we are saying that our exports are impacted because certain members are restricting, using restrictive measures, what are we doing about it? That's your opinion. Okay, second point. Like I was talking to uh, Srinath in the morning. Srinath, you're there. Srinath, right? So it's, it's a very, very fertile case to elevate and take it to the dispute. What have we done about it? Should it take 20 years and a director level officer to ask the secretary from the Geneva, can we raise a dispute? So that, that's my point I'm trying to say. Maybe, maybe mechanisms may be not aware of that. Grassroots. Yeah, that, this is the whole exercise. I'm trying to create that awareness. So that, that's the final objective. Not, not holding not fault with anybody. I'm, I'm as much part of this system as you are. I'm trying to say the thing that I observed and learned by being part of the committee and being part of the chair is the level of awareness that we have is not enough. So, raising an STC is not a big deal, it's easy, we can raise it. But do we understand the process beforehand to do it? Oftentimes, we might actually resolve an STC by acquiring the right information for which we need to be proactive. That's all I'm trying to say. Let's, let's move to the, the responsive side. Just to see, this is the other, other side of the coin. This is for the members who are on the defensive. 
So against whom the, the concern has been raised. So we call this the responding ten. And there you have EU and India in second place. So India has often been in the in the seat of those who are responding to trade concerns raised by others. Then you have China and the US, Indonesia, etc. Just a moment, Eric. India actually is number one. If you want to disaggregate EU to 27 countries. <laughs> I, I didn't dare to say. <laughs> I'm happy came to you. So, um, <clears throat> if you look at them, okay, the same graph with respect to responding. Who, who are the ones who are challenging India? And then maybe no surprise that the EU, US, Korea, Canada, and China are perhaps the, the ones who are mainly um, responding or <clears throat> raising concerns against. Sorry, not responding. Raising concerns against India. Then it, it, it duplicates against how much STCC it was responded. If the country base is given, then it gives a clear picture. Yeah. So if you look at the responding, um, again the same graph before and the trends. So responding to measures raised by the members, the, the green one <coughs> here is the EU. India is in red. So there is a clear number of, uh, there is a clear increase in in terms of uh, measures or countries complaining or raising concerns against India and India being on the responsive side. While you see a very stable, maybe even lowering level for Brazil, and US is very low. <coughs> no. Again, this is not a question of, this is just facts. It's, it's a way of showing the current situation then it is up to you to interpret this the way um, you wish in terms of how you can use this, this information. So just looking at last meeting, so that was the meeting last week um, in terms of the trade concerns, um, but Anwar already mentioned this, there were 18 trade concerns raised against India. I think that is that must be a record, I haven't seen it. There was 24. Okay, so it has been done. You've done your homework better. Right? So, <clears throat> specific trade, if you look at well, how, how are developing members doing overall um, in this area, and here, in terms of um, raising STCs, the blue here are developed countries, and uh, the green and the mixed are um, developing members. So there you see that there's an increasing number of, there's increasing again engagement by developing countries in, in the STC mechanism at, at the WPA. Um, the type of trade concerns that are raised, and this, now this is a very important point, and Anwar said this, but I wanted to make sure it's, it's really clear that most of the time, the, the reason why a measure is raised is that they simply want to have more information or clarification, it may not actually be a problem, but they have not been able to get the information bilaterally through bilateral contacts, so they raise it at the TBT committee. Or number two, like with a lot of the discuss, discussion we had yesterday, is an unnecessary barrier to trade, or they consider it to be an unnecessary barrier to trade. <coughs> so the objectives of the measure, there are two very on the top, which is uh, health and safety and protection of the environment. And in terms of specific trade concerns, it's a much more limited picture on the types of products that are covered, but it's, um, there's a large majority of electrical machinery and mechanical appliances as well as vehicles and beverages are key points. Yeah? <coughs> yeah. Beverages? 22, 9 coffee and tea. So, coffee and tea are also beverages? Yes. I think what, what the gentleman is pointing out is that tea and coffee are beverages. This is on the basis of a HS codes classification, so that's why they, they appear separately. Uh, but indeed, I had no clue, so <laughs> it's going to be the level of detail. <laughs> Thanks, Matteo. <clears throat> okay, um, there is also quite a strong correlation between notification and trade concerns. So with the increase of notifications, you have also seen an increase 
of trade concerns. So the blue are the notifications in the thousands and the orange line are the SECs in the hundreds on the right scale. So what what is the benefit or after these numbers? Anything more? Any questions on the numbers, on the data, or the background? Or anything more that wants to be said? My question is to Manwar sir. Sir, you told that uh, number of STCs from India are due to uh, lack of awareness or means uh, low level of awareness. So, is it not reciprocal? Means uh, other countries also are not having such awareness. For example, anthraquinone, it is a naturally occurring hydrocarbon. But some countries are classifying it as a pesticide. So our tea trade is being affected. Other, uh, in fact, anthraquinone is not a pesticide. Thank you. You're from the tea board. Yeah. So, yeah. In fact, this this agency is in the SPS committee, and uh, for this meeting, the SPS committee, which is uh, meeting on 22nd to 24, we have not raised this FTC. I have had a number of uh, interactions with the Russians, uh, not just anthraquinone, they have even cla classified the mold as part of the fruits and vegetables. These are the tricks which countries employ, right, it's not just awareness. If Russia is saying that this regulation is created by not Russia themselves, but they use, uh, what is that called? Uh, uh, the extended part of Russia on Eurasia, custom What is their intention? See, at this point in time, if you go into intention, we might not even have three days or six days. We can continue to talk about it. So we'll talk about the bare facts. So in, I'm not going with their intention. So I know where you're going at. The point I'm trying to say here is, they have repeatedly told us, the Russians, that rich regulation is not generated by Russia, but by the Eurasian region, the Customs Council. Yes. So please process, send your request and what your pro problem requirement is in official channel to the commission, they will have it examined. And it's been two years since we have not done it. So it's not just, uh, that's what I'm trying to say. When you said they're not uh, reciprocal, they're not aware. They may not. They, it's possible they're not aware. It's possible they're done deliberately. In both the cases, the onus is on us to write to the point where they are saying we should write and we haven't done it. And I am the live example. I am glad that you raised this point. It's been two years since we are trying to do this. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Um, just, just very quickly, the, the, the benefits of using the, the specific trade mechanism the, the last point here, it, it can help to the resolution of trade concerns without going to dispute settlement. Because it's a constructive forum, it's an open forum. Dispute settlement is, is costly, it's bilateral between two countries, it involves lawyers, nothing against lawyers, but they cost. It's after the fact, it's already too late, and you will have a ruling and you have to change it. So there are many, it's, you need dispute settlement function and a problem we have today is that it's a bit faltering because of the appellate body is not functional. But the committee process is, is more open and it's preemptive because it's about draft regulations before they have gone into force. There, so there is an, an ability or a potential to solve the problem before it's entrenched in law and becomes something that there, thereafter you have to get, get to a dispute settlement. So, because the TBT and the SPS agreements are about draft regulations, that's unique at the WTO. That enables you to nip the problem in the bud you know, before it's an issue, so it's good to engage. You will save a lot of costs later on. And plus it shows you a good faith, because you try to address the issue before it went into law, and you can say that if it becomes too late later. So also it's constructive, because you're working with peers at the committee, if you come with your experts, you will be with the experts from the different regulatory agencies present in the committee, and you speak the same language. So deal with it then, before it becomes too late. So I think the last point is, is very important. 
there is also going from the bottom up, there is also the awareness raising in general. Um, it improves transparency and information, the first, the first point. You can hear how other countries are using the forum and the TBT agreement for their own interests and maybe you will say, oh, we can do the same thing about that issue. You can, you can also join other members against one member where you have a big problem. If you are among others who have the same problem, then you join forces in the committee and you put more pressure. So there's a peer pressure element involved too because it's an open process. That's harder in the dispute or settlement context. So, I mean, just, that's... Just a, just a moment, Eric. Uh, when you're talking about resolution of trade concerns for bilateral meetings in the margins of the committee, is something which is very, very, you know, uh, interestingly, uh, uh, nowhere it is written that you should have uh, bilateral meetings to resolve your issues. It's something that people do uh, by instinct, by, by, by nature. Every TPT committee meeting, I, I witnessed part of it during COVID times and the other part uh, uh, when everything was open. People, when members were going to Geneva yes. while attending the regular meeting, they were having bilaterals on the sidelines. Uh, but when it became virtual, suddenly there was no need to be in Geneva to have bilaterals. The bilaterals could have had any time and because people were in the habit of having bilaterals during that week, there were a lot of uh, requests where bilateral requests were coming to India because of the number of SGCs. You talked about uh, entrepreneur. EU every time seeks bilateral requests because of the number of SGCs it is raising. And you can go on to records and see the number of communications we have sent to the capital asking we should have bilateral with EU and raise this issue. Forget about raising issue, we don't even have bilateral for the request. So, कहीं ना कहीं ना हम लोग चूक जाते हैं इस चीज में हम उनके नियत के ऊपर जाने से एक रीजन जो ये भी हो सकता है एंड वी आर अप्रोचिंग दैट दे आर नॉट सो एक्टिव बट एंड यू आर व्हेन वी आर अप्रोचिंग टू यू मीन डब्ल्यूटीओ दे बिकम सडनली वेरी एक्टिव नो 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 यू शुड टॉक टू अस यू शुड टॉक टू अस बट एंड वी वर ट्राइंग टू टॉक टू देम दे वर नॉट लिसनिंग अस सो not that helpless uh, because obviously it is very well structured like what Eric was saying you have bilaterals if your issue is resolved fine if not you can always elevate the matter to elevate the matter you should be convinced that it is a real issue have you done your work enough to elevate the matter are you yourself no but merely saying that they are not responding to us and leaving it at that putting the blame on them is not, not a point if you are serious and the matter is serious you have to elevate it you create a record, you sort bilateral for information, they are not bringing any information. You are serious, you raise an HTC, you are not satisfied with the response. You raise it twice, thrice, and then send them a notification. No response at all. Uh, that's good. That's good. Even more good. Even more, you, your case becomes stronger. Yes. Because, sir, sustaining this HTC, what is the over the years, five years, six years, seven years? Uh, um, but uh, means I have my own experience that sometimes uh, when uh, when a country is raising an issue against you and if you are technically well prepared your position to defend in that, that STC, sometimes on the margin of the meetings you have the bilaterals and the country withdraw their STC also. That's, that's means I have seen the case in, in case of China, means we had the bilateral with China and the China agreed on the points what we submitted and they withdraw the STC. So it helps, it always depends on how you have prepared this, uh, your case to the party. Okay. Thank you, that's, that's about the How about the afternoon? Yes, sir. Going on the nicotine issue, we have filed the WTO session on September 19th. So you can elevate it. That's what I, I, mean, I, I spoke to you the minute you said you are from pre board. I said, okay, what are we doing about it? I said, we have to raise it. No, no, we have to raise it. So if, if you are not getting a response, you ask for a bilateral, you ask for a bilateral at our activity level, you ask for a bilateral at a bilateral at the mission level, then elevate the matter. But every SPS activity meeting, they are dragging it as a STC, even after submitting so many clarifications, so many data. See, this is how it happens. Like Eric said right at the beginning, this is not a platform to resolve uh, uh, STCs. It gives you a platform to discuss and resolve between yourself and naturally. 
the mandate of its activity committee under Article 13 is very, very important, very important. You could do anything under it from having thematic sessions to having uh, triennial reviews to having new areas, introduction. It's almost like renegotiating part of the agreement. But what TBT agreement or the TBT committee cannot do is resolve a dispute for you. You have to do it uh, amongst yourself. That's so it works. gives you a platform for you to have that. It gives you a platform for you to raise in a structured, formal setting that this is a legit concern that you have raised against this legit. And that is why all this data is collected from those. So TBT chair, TBT secretariat, they cannot resolve. They can't call two parties to adjudicate between you. There is one example I had uh, when I used to work for the SPS committee uh, many years ago. There was an example of several countries from Africa around Lake Victoria who were trying to export fish to the European Union. And the European Union closed off their market because of cholera transmission through fish, with live fish products. And uh, I remember Kenya taking the floor saying this was a problem and why was this done. And then suddenly all the other countries around the lake took up the same issue and were questioning the science and the rationale behind this. But what really made the difference was the international standardizing body, WHO, through Codex, took up the floor and said, cholera is not transmitted through frozen fish. And all experts are frozen. So what's the issue? And the next meeting, the EU dropped the case. <laughs> so, so also, it goes to show sometimes it's good to also look at the observers. They have a very important role to play. And the international standard setting bodies, in this case, not always, but they can be a, a good reference to solve some of these, these issues. And it can also be a way of breaking a deadlock that comes between countries. It doesn't work always, but in some cases, that's worth it. Uh, so after understanding uh, the SDCs, it uh, appears uh, like that these are the tools to avoid disputes. and. Uh, while using this tool uh, in the TBT forum with the help of other particular countries, if uh, like Anwar sir rightly told that China came in to club one of the concerns. Like that, uh, in these particular TBT committees, such joint proposals also come in or the process is for like supporting the uh, one's uh, member's document by the others. And if it is the support and building up the consensus, uh, is there a possibility that other particular members can join in and come up with a joint proposal? There, all possibilities are open. You know, that's a bit the beauty of the system because, as Amar was saying, Article 13 provides a very wide mandate. So there's always possibility for members to come together and there have been examples of submissions on STCs which are jointly developed by a number of members against one or two members. So that's also possible if that was your question. Sir, could, could you please just uh, elaborate with the help of one recent example? Which okay, we can, what, the way we could do it, uh, maybe I, you have, uh, I can show them on the evening, uh, yeah. join the uh, HTC. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Typically what happens, you are from? Spicy food. Spicy food. So typically what happens is, uh, one country is concerned because their industry representatives have given them some information that their product is being blocked by some other country using some regulation or standard, whatever. So that country does its initial and body point, blah, blah, blah. STC raise with me. And when STC raise with that time, other members can join that STC. There is a time period before every committee meeting. For example, it was in March. We had a meeting on 8, 9, 10, 10. On uh, uh, Feb 28, or Feb 10. When was the last date for the STC, uh, for the last committee meeting? Uh, STC raising, was that 10 Feb? Yes. Probably 10 Feb, yeah. No, it was 20 days, right? It was 21, I think. I'm not quite sure. So, 21 days before uh, the meeting, you can register your STC. So, the minute you register an STC on the E agenda, E ping, other members see, okay, this product concerns me. So, they have, for example, India is raising an STC against EU. A similar concern perhaps must uh, also be for Paraguay or for, like last time in SP, uh, space, when we raised Paraguay reached us, Brazil reached us, uh, United States reached me, they, they were all asking you are raising this STC, uh, what, what are the details? We also have concerns, we will want to join the STC. 
So where one that is see pre ninety five to zero zero five uh, on the honey bees uh, and uh, uh, TM vaccine, there are uh, India raised that integrity. Now there are seven countries for supporting it against India. So it's a normal process. But if you don't support it before the deadline of the committee, it is not uh, you know mandated or it's not a hard line that you have to don't support by that time. You cannot support. You could actually support it from the floor. And you can join the STC in the next meeting. Countries do that because in case if some some STC gets elevated to a district level, they they will reap the benefit you know, without actually having to <laughs> anything else. Uh, Eric, that was his question. Yeah, maybe just one a small additional thought on that, which is. From what I've seen when talking to delegations when going to national workshops, is that countries think this decision very carefully. In that, sometimes they they think it's better to raise the STC themselves directly. Sometimes they prefer to support an STC, and 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 I don't exactly know the whole logic behind it, but simply to show that there are these various um, possibilities that members can use uh, to, to benefit from, from the process. You, you, you don't necessarily have to be in the driving seat all the time. You can accommodate depending on your needs, your industry needs, etc. The reason, I can, I can tell you why they, they take the decision of supporting and not being the proponent. If you are a proponent, you should be very certain that it is affecting your industry. Mm -hmm. If you have an iota of doubt, uh, for example, if I am working at Geneva, I have not got all my clearances from the capital, <coughs> and, and some of the officers are in the commerce are aware, but the line ministry is not aware. But I feel this is an issue we can support. So not having that full diligence, but we can join the bank back in, because you can always come away because you are not the proponent of the STC. That's how. It, that's how. At least I offer. That's an interesting nuance. Mm -hmm. um, I think I've gone through um, the, the main points of the presentation. The focus was really on the working of the committee and uh, SECs. The, the other, just to mention before we close, and I offer Anwar if there's anything else you want to say, but the other part of the committee work is on guidance and recommendations. So that we will see in terms of conformity assessment, the work we are doing in conformity assessment that Anwar is also leading in terms of what the committee can do in developing guidance. All through yesterday and today this morning, you heard about the six principles. Those were developed by the committee. That's an example of committee guidance. And they have a very important effect on trade, on the development of international standards. So what, what we are doing now is working on guidance for conformity assessment. So those are the two main functions of the committee. One, trade concerns. Two, development of guidance, of which we will see a little bit more later on conformity assessment maybe a, a word on the development of guidance. Remember <coughs> yesterday how we spoke about the WTO having 164 members and being based on consensus and therefore this, this very core feature leads to difficulties when it comes to creating new rules. So that's of course when it comes to new treaty rules of course because it becomes a new international treaty ba legally binding etc. What's beautiful about the TBT committee in particular is that there is this alternative route to creating useful rules that keep the agreement alive without the need to create a new international treaty. So, so this is what, you know, in the, in the legal field, some people call soft law, guidance. It, it, it's something that maybe doesn't have quite the legal status of an international treaty, but that doesn't mean that it is not as useful because of course when members do agree to developing guidance on a particular issue and we'll speak about CAP in a minute then of course then members then take it seriously in terms of, of, of following that guidance and I think the, the, the one example about unique guidance provided in the past um, is the so-called six principles that especially we discussed in the morning with, with the colleagues from the Bureau of Indian Standards just, just to show a uh, 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 keyboard sitting up, just, uh, uh, spy board. 
I'll take it the way you are asking. So you look at this. This SSC is actually raised more than SPS and TBT. This is a measure of uh, European Union, uh, their EU regulation 396 2005. It's a very interesting uh, regulation. When we raised it, there were only seven. Now you can see the number of countries. These are the countries that have raised it. These are the countries that are supporting it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I said seven, now they're nine. And look at the number of countries that are supporting. Uh, so it's always possible, and this is a very interesting case where European Union is saying they're banning uh, these two <coughs> chemicals. If you can see, cow, oh, I, I always struggle to pronounce this. And then glothianidine and thiamexin. <laughs> so what they're saying is, if you're using these chemicals, in, in your field, they are destroying the honeybees or pollinators. So they have brought it down to the level of determination, which means uh, uh, the minute a trace of this is available, there is no limit, so it means it becomes illegal. In, in response to this, Brazil made a very interesting uh, reply. Brazil said, if Pollination and bees are dying, it should be confined to your area in Europe, if that is where you want to stop this. Why are you trying to impose your regulations on the rest of the world, where this has got absolutely no impact? And the study is confined only to, uh, they had done some small study in Europe and they are juxtaposing all over the world, or so uh, elevating. Another interesting point what he said was, a particular region in Brazil, which produces 80% of the honeybee, has increased its production using it to 150% in last three years. <laughs> so, this is going to gather a lot more traction in times to come. I don't know how you will uh, you know, respond to this, but this is a way you can always join support. Thank you. Okay, thank you. That was a great, good final example. Are there any other questions in the room? Oh. To the chair. Uh, you told about sub subcommittees. What are the subcommittees in the DBT? Not subcommittees of DBT. When I said, I was talking about selection of chairman at that point, I said, right? Yes. No, uh, WTO has the primary tier one committees and then has got tier two committees. In the tier 1 committees, you have committee on trade in your CTG, trade and goods. And part of the trade and goods committees in the next, uh, 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 I think it is uh, all those agreements that are falling in the annex 1A has got those committees. They are about 13 or 14 committees. They are all called as subcommittees. So, TBT is a subcommittee. Huh? I, I hope uh, that is clear. So, now, interesting, interesting point. Now, since I am talking about it, I will just clarify this point as well. WTO works at three levels. One, you are negotiating rules. And rules were negotiated and formulated in 95. And some of those rules you are renegotiating, some new rules you are negotiating. So that is a negotiating work. Second, whatever you have negotiated and you have committed is being monitored through these formal committees. And TBT was negotiated, TBT agreement was negotiated, and that agreement commitments of the monitored to TBT committee. If things go uh, sour, then it can go to the third function of the TBT, which uh, third function of the WTO, which is dispute resolution. Right? Okay, that's it. Yeah. Sir, the STC is raised. What's the role of the chairperson in the one? Being a uh, India chairperson, whether you, what is your role when India's are you keeping out of the chair? Are you still in this? No, uh, it's a good question. I mean, what is the uh, chair's role? I will leave a, uh, uh, I will ask uh, Eric to pass his judgment on my chairmanship. <laughs> uh, but because I am in the chair, I cannot be part of, I, I can't represent as a member of India. So once I became a chair, our uh, other counselor, his name is Ashish Chandurkar, you must have heard of him. Uh, he, he looks after NAMA issues, so he replaced me as a member delegate representing India on the floor. When I am in the chair, I am a neutral person. Uh, my duty is to ensure <coughs> that 
uh, meeting is conducted within the time frame. Just like Lok Sabha is meeting. Not necessarily. <laughs> Lok Sabha speaker ke liye bahut sare logo tamasha karte hain, ya jo bhi hai, agitate hote hain. Nee, wo wahan pe party neutral ho jate hain, niche utarte hi party hote hain. Then, which is true, which is true. <laughs> Struggling to find a right word, all I can say is member delegate on the floor in TV committee are very, very respectful, respectful of each other when they speak. I leave it. Yeah, no, I, I can't comment on what you said. The only thing I would say is, unfortunately, we can't re-elect him. We don't have the powers. <laughs> we can't re-elect you. Uh, so it would be nice to have Anwar another year. But, uh, we can, count, we can count on this process taking a little bit more time, so I think we'll have you in June, but we will not, we'll, we'll see. Oh, okay. Uh, since what is the benefit for India, I becoming a chair, one was, obviously, I was able to convince authorities back home that there is an issue that we can all come together. Today we are sitting here because I'm sorry, that's not the outcome of the idea. Now TPT committee does uh, regular meetings as well as informal meetings. So my one question is like what is the difference between informal meetings and regular meetings? Other is what are the normal agenda plans for the Yeah, so the difference between informal and regular Okay, like that's a good question. I think we have to take a moment. Uh, like I said, uh, three layers, WTO works at three layers. One is negotiation, renegotiation. Second is monitoring of the commitment. Third is the <coughs> TBT committee by inherent nature, or SPS committee, or any CMA committee by inherent nature, are supposed to be doing only the monitoring work of the commitments that have been made. In the formal meeting, you only take up those issues of which members have committed in those agreements, and whether other members have concerns about this member not uh, performing to those commitments, right? Now the other function, which is negotiation. Negotiation is a very informal activity. There is nothing formal about it. You are making a proposal, I am making a response to it. So we need to arrive at a certain point. So we conduct those negotiations in special sessions in other committees. For example, in, 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 for example, in I look after agriculture also, we have a special session for agriculture. For this, we have a special session. A special session created for negotiations. But for TVT, there are no special negotiations. So whatever new work or quality of the agreement if we think has to be improved, we talk in the informal sessions. So those informal sessions, since you are asking what role do I play, how much of uh, 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 might I have, I don't have a lot of might in formal committee because Eric and Matheo will not allow me to do anything. But informal, <laughs> I have a whole lot. And he was saying that I am not agreeing for a meeting on May 5th, that was one example. <laughs> and another difference is that the, in formal meetings there is no record. So the formal meetings there is a, a record, minutes, where what, what you say in the formal meeting is recorded and you can't get away from it. We can make it look a bit better when we do the minutes, but we can't do much. While in formal it's uh, much easier to have a frank uh, discussion. I want to just to mention, sorry, go ahead on uh, Eric, but if I am correct, for informal meetings also, the report of the chairperson comes, you see, it is published on the, yeah. uh, that is also at for TVTR. That is, that's the way you establish the link from informal to formal. At the end of the day, whatever you have done in informal has to be formally told to somebody. So, nitty-gritties of positions are found, positions are will not be there. Our chair's report will be presenting, uh, you know, what happened and where we are, how it is without ascribing it to anybody because each formal committee still has a mandate to, like I said, Article 13 is very vast. So you could do a lot of things. So one of the elements, not just for this committee, other committees also have a report of the chair from the informal consultation. But the chair can do anything. You, you can, uh, the chair can have consultations, which is another level. And there it's your choice. If you want to uh, report back or not. So I wanted to just <laughs> there, was, there was something on the screen, it's a document called the Annual Review. After coffee you'll see it, but that has a lot of the sources and all the graphs, etc. 
So you can look at that for two months. And this annual review, review report, in which month it usually published? We just published it in March. In March or March? So thank you very much. Thank you, Anwar, for the <laughs> Erica, have you got to settle down? We'll start the session in the next two minutes.